Welcome to Your Journey. I'm your host, Chuck Lewis, and we got a special guest with us today in Jawan Chisholm, a.k.a. Been Like This. What's going on, man? What's up, Chuck Lewis? What's up, man? What's going on? I'm doing well, man. Obviously, right now, uh, in this pandemic, dealing with COVID-19, how are you and your family adjusting with everything going on right now? I mean, everything's pretty decent, man. I can't complain. Uh, I still got to go to work. My wife's still here. Uh, my son can't go to daycare, so she's handling that along with my son. So that's some superhero type stuff. Uh, <laughs> my daughters, uh, both my daughters, we have 50-50 with the other parents we split. So they both doing a good job on it, and we doing a good job. So we all making it work, just co-parenting and just making it all happen. It ain't too bad, man. It could be worse. Yeah, I know, man. Same on my end, man. Just trying to juggle, you know, watching the kids at the same time, trying to work from home. It's been a challenge. and It's taken a long time for me to adjust to that. You know what I mean? But other than that, man, just being thankful and blessed to be alive. You know, some people have lost their lives during this COVID-19 period. So just trying to stay positive, man, and just trying to adjust to this new normal. So let's get right into it, man. So Jawan Chisholm, uh, you're from Harrisburg, PA. Talk to me about what it was like growing up in Harrisburg as a kid. Harrisburg, man. Uh, you know how I represent Harrisburg. <laughs> you know how I feel about Harrisburg. Even my wife be saying, like, why I love Harrisburg so much. I don't know. I still can't even really explain it. Uh, I love Harrisburg, man. It's, it, it's what made me, man. It's what, it, it's what I come from. It's, it's everything that it wasn't supposed to be, but you still made everything out of it that was supposed to come out of it, you know? Yeah. Growing up there, man, I was like regular, any other kid, man. Uh, I had my mom and my dad. Uh, they split up around like, what, seventh, eighth grade, I want to say. Uh, that was kind of hard a little bit, but they both stayed in my life. Uh, they both co-parented. They both uh, did what they were supposed to do. So I didn't have the hardest life, you know, but growing up, I choose to do some decisions that, uh, you know, wasn't, I wasn't taught as a child. And uh, I paid the consequences for him, you know. So, give or take, man, my childhood was pretty good, man. I can't really get on here and say it was super horrible. Or I can't say it was, like, super good, you know. It was just, like, in the middle, like, just like how I am, man. It's like a middle middle type of guy, middle class type of guy, you know. Just try to keep it smooth in the middle. So, that's pretty much how my childhood was, man. It wasn't too bad. You know, I grew up with, with I had two, three sisters, two sisters and four brothers so three brothers so two sisters and three brothers man i'm the youngest um mm -hmm. uh, so that was that that was kind of fun i mean growing up being the youngest uh you you get away with a lot more things when you're young you know that yeah. you're young and you're the youngest of the of, of the family you get away with a lot more things and you know they get mad at a lot of stuff but at the same time it's all love they love you man they, they love you the life and that's just what it was in my household. It was it was love, man. I grew up with my brother and my sister in one household, and my other brother and my other two brothers and a sister in another household. But my dad held it down, my mom held it down. They all co-parent. Uh, so props to them, man. And that's how my childhood pretty much was, you know. And when you say childhood, what age range we talking about, Chuck? Man, pretty much probably from like uh, you know from time of your toddler years or the time you're born to like. You know, high, before you got to high school, you know, so just like those. Okay, so I, I gave you, I, I definitely just gave you the, the, the great rundown before high school. When I got to high school is when it turned, you know, it did a little 360, but we made it happen, man. We made it happen. We made it happen. Yeah, so uh, let's jump right into that, man. So you attended Harrisburg High School. What was your experience like there as a student and also as an athlete? Long ride, uh, ninth grade year, uh, just like a basically like a new, just a new setting, new kid. You you know, going in is like a regular kid, shy. You know, I played basketball and football. I sell that both of those. Uh, so ninth grade year, going into the end. I suffered a gunshot wound. You, uh, we know that. Uh, so I suffered a, a fatal gunshot wound. Actually, uh, a shotgun to the foot, to my left foot. 
so as soon as I go to the doctors, the first thing they say was uh, amputated from your toe to your ankle. Mm. Man, <laughs> toe to your ankle, I know it's sports, you know? Right. So at that point, man, my dad and my family and them um, is there, and God bless you. I mean, that's, that's why we say fathers is important, man. I mean, super important. Mm. Let's just say if my dad wasn't there, my foot would be off and we wouldn't be having this story. It wouldn't be nothing to talk about. Right. Would I be here? Who knows? You know, like, I don't know, man. God had something bigger for me, though. But like I said, I suffered that, man. Went to the hospital and I spent 17 days in there. But the first day I went in there, they like, can we take me to the ankle? My dad told everybody to get out the room. Whatever conversation he had with him, that doctor, uh, and God uh, intervening with that, uh, that pretty much uh, was the reason why I got to play sports uh, going forward. Yeah. So, like, in the process of, like, you going through battling back, trying to rehab um, physically and then also trying to repair yourself mentally, where are you just at with football? Where are you at with, like, your life? And then what's the next step forward? Like, what's your vision moving forward just with everything? Uh. After all of that happened, man, that was a rough, that was a rough 17 days. And then just, uh, all, all of the, all of the stuff that it went into it after that. So, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Take your time. Yeah, so like as you just in the process of just trying to rehab with everything, um, just where are you at just mentally with everything and like your outlook on life, just where are you at trying to rehab mentally and physically? Mentally, man, going through that rehab, it was tough because I had, uh, once I got done with sports, it was hard, man. It was just like, now I'm trying to find out how to still be the man. Mm -hmm. And this little old city, and just something that any urban kid go through. Uh, you know, growing up, any urban kid, you know, especially if you from the city, and you know, some of your brothers and sisters might have been, or your siblings might have been into the streets. Not saying that my brothers and sisters was, but I'm just saying uh, you might see your peers, and you know, you're forced to do wrong things sometimes. And I jumped into that, uh, so I jumped into the streets and still trying to balance out, you know, uh, training during this time. So I'm lost for real. I don't really know uh, what's what and what I really want to do and what I really want to be. All I know is they said an amputation from toe to ankle. So I'm like, all right, I probably never play again anyway. You know what I mean? So uh, I just kept going. Though. I kept making it somehow. Uh, God kept getting me there, uh, getting me to my destination to uh, – Rehab, which was a uh, lady now. I want to say, I know her last name was Cox. I don't want to get it wrong, but I think it's Sarah Cox. Both her brothers played in the NFL as well. I give her props because she remembered my name and uh, she shouted me out an uh, article in a uh, newspaper article as well. And uh, she helped me. Like she said, her brothers and stuff went through the same thing. So I think that might have, you never know who God put in your life to do certain things, but. I don't know if she impacted me or not. I can't fully say that, but she told me some stories and I guess that kept me interested. I kept going. It was hard. I wasn't really, I wasn't playing no sports. So I'm going to a rehab for something that I don't even really know what I'm going for at this point. Cause I don't know if I'm going to play again anyway. Yeah. So uh, I kept going through that and I, I finally got through that. Fast forward. Uh, I'm still in a, uh, doing a little wrong things and, uh, intervening and uh, other things I shouldn't be into and uh, trying to balance that out, like I said. But 
once all of that got done with rehab and stuff, I finally got my shot to go back out on the field, which was my 11th grade year because I missed my 10th grade year. And fast forward through my 10th grade year, it was the same thing as the end of my 9th grade year. I was lost. I started walking after about, I can't skip over that, Chuck. Once I did uh, get out of all of that and once I did uh, go through all of that, uh, now I'm at home for nine months. I'm on crutches and uh, I'm on crutches for seven months. It was supposed to be like four or five, but it kept going. Every time I go back, the extra money, it ain't heal right. Uh, all right, extra money, it ain't heal right. But I understand I was in there for 17 days for a foot shot. I mean, most people get in and out in a day, but it was a shotgun wound, which was I reconstructured my foot together like a jigsaw puzzle, like literally. Yeah. I got skin from my thigh on my foot. Uh, Skin graft, as as you would say, uh, I got multiple uh, screws, and I still got pellets in my foot. I got over well over seventy pellets still in my foot, and every time you get an X-ray, you still see it in there. And uh, also, given the doctors that did my foot props, uh, those doctors are supposed to leave out that what that week. But as I said, my dad talked to the doctors and whatever and him and God had going on and whatever God was watching over me doing. Uh, the two doctors that were supposed to leave that week stayed an extra 17 days for me. So that was the biggest blessing. And they had just seen something just similar to mine about, I can't give you a time frame, but it had to be within them five years. That same guy was in the high school. He was a former, he was a, a state uh, state championship wrestler. He was a former, uh, or he lived on the farm, and his family did farming, and a machine fell down on his foot, like it smashed it, and they had to fuse his bones all back together and all that, the same way they did with me. So that's two people. So, man, that's God, man. That's, that's two people that he saved from who knows, like, who, who knows what goes on after that if I didn't play any sports. So that's or what knows what that guy would have did that living on the farm. I'm pretty sure we got two different lives, but you know, everybody go through their own struggles. So ain't no telling what we would have went through if we didn't have those doctors or God wouldn't put those doctors there. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely so was a was a blessing from God, like with you being able to recover back, um, just with the rehab and then mentally be able to recover back. And I can only imagine what you had to go through just from a mental perspective. It's one thing to go through it from a physical perspective but the mental perspective is a whole nother thing. But you were able to bounce back uh, in your junior year. You were able to make it back onto the football field. How did it feel to officially get back out there and doing what you love? Once I got back out there, my 11th grade year, uh, my uncle or my cousin, which I call most of my cousins, my uncles, I don't know why. Uh, cousin Blue, rest in peace to him, God rest his soul. Uh, he was a football coach at my high school. We had a uh, he had a problem, a drug problem, and uh, he still came and showed us love every day when he could. Everybody, ain't nobody perfect, nobody whatsoever. Uh, it's crazy again, whatsoever. Like that's my cousin, like my mom's uncle, and he was a sports player. He went to Arizona State, didn't know none of this. He was in the army and all of that. But I say his name to say this. Uh, I had my first run. I remember I had my first run. We had no football equipment or nothing on. And uh, I just remember it was like, hey, it ain't feel right. I was like, yeah, I can't find come back in this. It's probably over. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, especially what you hear the doctor say, like, your mind's a strong thing, a powerful thing. And I'm like, yeah, I probably, nah, it's, it's probably over. This is the beginning of the season before we put no pads or anything on. Mm -hmm. I remember myself about to like walk off. My cousin Blue just pulled me to the side, like, "Hey, man, just keep going. Like, you look all right. You look pretty good." I can't remember the exact words. I'd be lying if I sit here and just told you like what he pretty much said. But the words was basically, "Just keep going. Like, give it a try." And maybe that's that military mindset that he had, and also that family member in him that reached out to me, like, "Hey, listen, you look better than what you thought you were." So from that day, I stuck to it, and uh. I took it full throttle from there. I was a basketball player as well, but I never played basketball again. So I knew I was taking it full throttle. I mean, my 11th grade year, I trained three times a day, no matter what I did. And I was still, you know, still in, doing wrong things at the time. Uh, but God worked with me and God got me through it. And he's seen bigger things. And I'm I'm basically doing two things at one time, but I'm putting football first. 
But I haven't played football in two years now. You know, I'm still dealing with this identity thing. Like, I'm still trying to, you know, trying to keep up. So uh, I still knew football was my ticket, though. So I just kept on going and I just kept training and training. And my 11th 11 grade year, I ran for like, I'm going to say, I know it was over 1,061 mm-hmm. and about a couple hundred receiving yards. And I was like, all right, I'm back, man. You know what I mean? I'm back. That was a, that was a happy moment. And just as, as it went, because in the beginning of that season, nobody knows. I only played like eight games, really. Right. Beginning of the season, I went out there. I wasn't the same person. Everybody knew it. Everybody was rooting. It was like I feel like a lot of people was rooting against me too. Mm-hmm. And they put these two dudes in front of me. I'll never. I won't say their names, but they from the city, man. I respect them, you know. But I knew they wasn't better than me. No way, no possible. Even on my foot, it was. But uh, legendary George Chump, he coached at Marshall. He coached at uh, Ohio State. Uh, he coached uh, Ernie. What's his name? Ernie. Ohio State uh, running back. Running back, yeah. Uh, slipping my mind right now. I can't think of his name, but it'll come to me. Yeah, Ernie. I'm going to say Ernie Davis. If that's not his name, then hey. But Ernie from Ohio State, he coached him. And uh, he told me, like, I wasn't big enough. I didn't run hard enough. And he said, I walked slew foot like mm-hmm. Ernie did. He said, I walked slew foot. And that's the way I walked. He said, so I wasn't really a running back. He put me at DB. My first two games at DB, I got torched. <laughs> That people who don't know. I wanted to play running back though, but he said I was too little and I was coming back. I didn't have really no say so. So I just kept a course, man. Yeah. The two guys didn't pan out. And Central Dolphin came a big rival, bro. Like a big rival, man. I'm like, it gave me the ball. I said, it's time to go. My yeah. first carry was for like 15 yards, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And then the rest just went on. I had like 16 carries for like 91 yards or 97 yards. Yeah. And I want to say a touchdown. I had this big scut helmet on, Chuck. And everyone was like, man, I'm back, man. I got on a number. I got on number three. I don't even know what I'm doing for. I picked it at the beginning of the season. I was just like, I ain't going to play for real anyway. Yeah. Man, God worked it out. God got me through it, man. Like, how just the light, the light switch turned on about around college. They started coming in and seeing and stuff. But what happened was I slipped up. My grades wasn't right. Mm. Um, times where I was dealing with both sides of defense with football and the other and, and the other side, it caught up. Yeah. And now it's like, dang, I really want to play football. I'm just like, God, you know, don't do this to me again, man. I can't go back that way. Yeah, so like in the midst of like you trying to balance your life, you know, off the field, uh, you find a way to to to, to gain success. Uh, in your senior year and kind of figure it out from an athletic standpoint, man, you scored 26 touchdowns, you rush over a thousand yards. What went into that off season coming up into your senior year, both mentally and physically to help you perform at the level that you did? A lot of training, man. I started eating right and everything. 12th grade year, I pretty much cut out everything off. I was no longer on both sides of the fence. Uh, I was taking it more serious. My dad was like my personal chef. <laughs> That's funny, man. I'm a ride or die. That's my guy, man. Uh, he's like my personal chef. Uh, I trained a lot, man, and it was just time to go. I was ready, man. And, uh, I left everything alone. I took it serious. First game of the season, toe turf. I mean, oh, uh, yeah. Turf toe. Turf toe. Uh, mm-hmm. I suffered that, and I just kept going through the season. And it was on the opposite foot of what I got shot on. So it was. If you don't know, every day I walk with pain on my foot. Everybody, I mean, everybody don't know that because I don't complain about it. But even when I play football, like pain every time. Like I have pain. It's not a day that I don't really go without pain when I walking on it. So I wear certain types of shoes. But yeah, man, my 12th grade year, I took it. I took it full heat and was ready, and I just took it all the way. And uh, I worked out. I trained. I, I I slept right. I ate right. I did everything I was supposed to do. And uh, it paid off, but like I said, after the 26 touchdowns and the uh, uh, records and everything else into the season, what happens? Now it's like, okay, it's school picking time. Everybody else picking schools. I'm seeing guys in the city not as good. And I want to say this to kids, if you watch this, man, I don't care how good you are. If you're in high school, you must have the grades. Your coach has nothing to do with the NCAA clearinghouse. No matter how good you are, you will be stuck at whatever you're stuck at. 
but that worked out for me and uh, I took my ACT uh, SAT and uh, luckily I got in at the last minute and uh, I had other schools Syracuse Iowa came in uh, I really love Syracuse though I think I would have went there Syracuse uh, Iowa uh, Penn State Rutgers uh, Penn State's uh, recruiter uh, the legendary uh, off the defense alignment coach oh, yeah. uh, uh, Larry oh. Johnson senior yeah. He told me, he said, you'll never come to Penn State because your grades are not good enough. But if you do get into school and you get out of this situation, in this area, you'll have a great career. Wow. Was to me. And I was like, looking back at it, that's the realest thing that anyone can ever say because there are all the other coaches who's like, oh, yeah, we'll be back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, go, you're the best. We'll be, you know, they sugarcoat everything and lie to you as soon as they go out the doors to the next uh, student athlete. So, uh, Larry Johnson, man, thank you for that. Yeah, so you end up committing to the University of Akron. Uh, so you leave Harrisburg and go to Northeast Ohio. Talk about that first year and what that transition was like from an academic standpoint and an athletic standpoint. Wow. First of all, let's talk about how I got there. <laughs> I didn't even know I was – basically going to be coming there chuck uh cultural crew call like hey could we wait another semester blah 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 i'm like I, you know if i go to prep school we both know we're not coming here so i know them got me to come there i come there uh they call me i got done with summer school classes because remember y'all was in camp when i got there uh i was in summer school classes and i had got an a i was in a driver's ed class i failed the driver's ed class my senior year which I had to go get a credit for because I needed it for my physical education to get into school. Mm. So uh, I finally got there, man, and uh, they called me at like, what, like I got there at like two in the morning, and that next day I had to get up at six, man. And I'm coming from Harrisburg. I'm like, what? <laughs> listen, man, I don't know. Like my first week in there, I'm like, man, listen, y'all got two months scheduled. This is two months stuff. Mm-hmm. But it was something in the back of my head too, saying, you know where you're going back to, right? I'm just like, all right, cool, just keep on going. And uh, one day, after one practice, a coach or crew was like, hey, man, you, you got the I-81 pace. I said, what's that? He said, you're like, he said, you're like, you about to pack your bags and go. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I am. I am. Like, you must have seen this a million times. I'm like, nah, coach, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And, uh I just kept going, man. I kept practicing, and uh, I ran into you. And I'm not saying this because I'm on hair, because you you know what type of guy I am. I don't yeah. share coach nothing. I don't care who you are, what it is. And uh, I ran into you, and uh, I remember I coming in the study hall. You could tell, man. I still was stuck in. You could see it in my face. I remember you uh, approaching me like uh, he was like, uh, "We're sitting at the back. We're sitting at the back table." And he was like, "Look out the window." And I told my wife this, yo, this is a true story, Chuck. Like, I'm not saying it because you're on here, man. Yeah. He, said, he was like, man, look out there. He was like, what you see? And I'm like, uh, I'm like, nothing for real. I was like, this is people. And he was like, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but he's just like, you just see people with backpacks. You see people trying to be successful. You see everybody trying to do the right things. And I'm like, wow, that's true. He was like, you're going to be what your environment is. He said, I don't know if you – I can't remember if you was like uh, – pretty much in all in, – in all in all, in, in all everything, you was like, man, look out there and look what you'll be at back home. And I looked out there and outside of there looked way more better than back home. And I'm just like, yeah, you're right. He's like, you look a lot of success, man. And that goes to just show you, man, hang around a millionaire, you'll be a millionaire. You hang around positive, you'll get positive. Yeah. you got somebody that's – uh, influence you that's trying to help you out you'll get helped out you know so I yeah think- like just to touch on that man um basically what i try to talk to a lot of guys that come from like a, a similar environment as you came from is is that man you got to understand man like you're in a new environment so you know there's an opportunity man for you to change the landscape you know of maybe your family's history or just change the landscape of your life and so you got an opportunity man just to get an education to, to go to school and if you're fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go to school for free you know and leave out of college debt free and, and, and an opportunity to live out your dreams and so there's so many people on this campus 
um, that you can connect with. And then just the campus itself, it's a lot safer than some of the places that we come from. And so just understanding the environment, understanding like, hey man, what you did before, this is a this is a new opportunity, a new place, a new environment. So you're just gonna have to adjust a little bit, but there's a lot of help there for you. And you found a way to adjust. So in your red shirt freshman year, uh, you end up earning the start and running back spot. You rushed for close to a thousand yards. I think you ran for 960 yards. And you also made the freshman All-America team. You know, how did it feel to achieve those accomplishments? That was a good feeling, uh, Chuck, because, you know, going into the first game of the season, once again, uh, I wasn't supposed to be the starter versus Ohio State. It was supposed to be Broderick Alexander. Broderick ended up pulling a quad or a hamstring. And next thing you know, it's like, whoa, you still only a freshman, dude. I ain't expect to start versus Ohio State. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I know I, I, I know, I thought about it in my head. I'm, I know I told people I did, but I'm like, ah, that's a little different. <laughs> that was a little different, man. And then we get there, man. And this happened like three days before the game. We get there and hey, just do what you do what you know. I ain't scared of nothing. Like I tell everybody, I get the jitters, you know, I get like butterflies and stuff. And I feel like that's it's time to go, man. It's time to go. Like, I don't care who you are or what it is. And once I get those butterflies, I'm ready to go at – I'm ready to go to war. And that's pretty much what we did. We lost bad. You know, we had a bad game. But it was good, man, all around. I got the experience. We got the experience. We got to go in there and play hard and tough. And we didn't come out with a good, out, uh, good outcome. But, hey, man, we learned as a team, man. One thing I loved about that team that year, man, was a lot of us are still close to this day because of what we went through and what we accomplished ourselves. Even though we went 1-11, man, we still accomplished a lot within right. our own goals and our own sanity, man. Like, people people don't know what we really went through outside of that 1-11. We went through some stuff. Yeah. So, so you even have more success in the next season. Uh, you rushed for five yards per carry, had over 1,200 all-purpose yards. You know, what went into that offseason for you to play at that high level? Oh, man, I had to lose weight because we went from the pro style. Remember with Ionella, we went from the pro style back to the spread. And uh, I ran spread in high school, so I was just switching back and forth. So I was going from – and I'm still dealing with that to this day, Chuck. Like, my weight goes up and down, up and down, up and down. So, like, I had to get up to 220 with Ionella. I got up to 220 before you know it for the season, and I'm I'm at my natural weight, really. Ended up at like 205. But for the spread, I had to get down when uh, uh, Coach Ballard and them came in. I had to get my weight down. So that whole all season was different, man. I, I, I trained on quick twitch with uh, my trainer, Ryan Max, uh, Mackis, and uh, I trained on uh, quick twitch like crazy, man. And I learned some stuff about myself that year that I didn't even know about myself. I trained very hard. I came back home to train hard. Uh, I was just having my child around that time. So that was still, you know, I did everything I was supposed to, man. Like I say, man, God really worked with me. And I know I keep saying God, but God worked with me, man. Like I really feel I was the reason I'm here today for him. So yeah, yeah definitely. I work with you, man. And, and, um, had you on the right path. Uh, so you finished your career as the all-time leading rusher uh, in Division One history at the University of Akron. Uh, you gained over over 4,000 all-purpose yards in your career. How does it feel to go down in history as one of the all-time greats at the University of Akron? That's good, man. That's crazy. I was just on Twitter yesterday, and it's a guy named number seven, uh, Tion Tyler, I want to say, or Dollar. Tion uh, Dollar, remember that name. He'll probably be in the league, so he's good. But I was just tweeting, man, like, hey, it's good to watch another back with the same number and everything look good, man. He look even better than me a little bit, I feel. I ain't going to say he is better, but, you know, he looks better than me, and I love it when the young guys is out there doing that, man. And I feel like I left a – I feel like even though we went 3-11 and 11 for three years in a row, in the last two, we went out with, like, five games. So that's a big jump, man. That's like – that's equivalent to a team going from four wins to nine wins, you know, like four wins to eight games, all the – because we started at one, so we got to five. That was a big difference, man. And it felt so good. It felt like we left the blueprint, man. Definitely. And remember, my last run of my college career was 80-yard touchdown, and that was to put us up 18 to 
20, I want to say, mm-hmm. or 18 to 23. Mm-hmm. With like less than a minute left, man, and they drove and Kent State drove it down, man. I still, I, I, man, I still get mad at that, Chuck. That's a that's a hard pill to swallow, man, knowing that we came from no, from those one games, man. We was just one game away from going to a bowl game. Right. At the end of the day, I ain't no selfish dude, man. I feel like, that's why I said I feel like we laid the blueprint in that team because that following year, Jaja, Jatavis Brown, and all them guys, and Cody, uh, Cody and them, and uh, all the other guys went out there and got a ring, man. And that was accomplishment. And I'm happy for them, man, because you got to say you got a piece of something on your hand, man. That's all I ever wanted, Chuck. I ain't never get a ring in high school, no nothing, man. If I could have ever got that, that's all I could have. Yeah, that's what I well, that's what I could have wished for, man. But the youngins got it, man. And I'm happy for that. And I'm happy for them, man. I'm happy for Akron right now. And they forever and better than me, man, because they're the only ones who took a chance on me. And that's why I stayed there and I went through the struggle there and all of that. Maybe because of guys like you, but like Akron was, was really like a second home to me. No, nah, for sure, man. I think you guys definitely laid the uh blueprint down, as you said, the the team the next year went to the bowl game and actually won the bowl game and won eight games that year. So your class of guys, whether it was you or Keith Skyers and those individuals uh, that were on those teams, man, helped lay that foundation for that team in 2015 to go out there and and do what they did uh, in the Idaho potato ball with the victory. So your success continues to climb. Uh, So pro day comes that year. Uh, You played in a few all-star games and worked out for a couple of different teams um, but the Akron Pro Day comes, you run a four four seven. you jump 10 foot 10 in the broad jump, you had 19 reps on the bench, you know, what preparation went into training to help you to operate at that high of a level on Pro Day? Well, I trained in Duluth, Georgia, man, uh, I had something called FS1, uh, I, I made the best out of it, man, we... There was a couple guys there. We made the best out of it, man. I mean, we trained hard. We tried to eat. I mean, we did eat right. We slept right. I mean, when you go to the NFL draft training, that is a different training. I'm talking about water the whole two months. I'm talking no Gatorade, no juice, no nothing. Yeah. I'm talking about we eating fish eggs, some stuff I never ate before, never even thought of eating. And I'm just like, it's what it takes, man. I'm, I got to do it. So, man, you going through all of that, man, just sacrifices and getting up early and training three times a day for two months. Not no training that these guys are doing at the gym where they go every day. This is brutal training, man. You're training for specifically four or five drills. That bench press, your 40, your L drill, and your 5, 10, 5, I want to say, your shuttle drill. And you're training for those, man, and literally that's what you train for for that whole two months, man, and you eat right. You sleep right. You also learn a lot about yourself. That was the best I ever felt in my entire life, Chuck. If someone can do that at a full throttle pace and all those guys that work out on a daily, man, I know that helps out your health in the long run, man. So I definitely encourage working out, man. That turned me up to another level. I felt the best I ever felt. And, uh, you know, just going into that, man, I was just like, it's all or nothing, man. I'm trying to feed my family. 4-4, four, four, hey, they said I was going, they said I was a 4-5, four, 4-6 four, guy. The same guy that told me at an all-star game, he was a reporter, he said, you're running a 4-6, four, 4-7. Four, I watched you play a couple games. He said, yeah, you ain't watched right then. I don't know what you watching. I said, I run a 4-4, four, four, uh, uh, high 4-3. Mm-hmm. Ran at 4-4, four, four, uh, at 4-4-7. Four, four, he was like, whoa, wrote an article and everything, man. So, shouts out to him, man. But I worked hard for it, man. God bless me. I did everything right that I was supposed to do. I don't have no regrets about nothing. I bust my butt and I gave it all I could give. And the results, uh, you know, came at the end. No, nah, for sure, man. I mean, I think one thing about your career, uh, if you watch any games that you played in, uh, anytime you broke a long run, you never got caught from behind. I mean, so that speaks for itself right there. No matter what the 40 times said, man, you was a guy, if you broke out, nobody ever caught you from behind. So the NFL draft comes up. And you watch the rounds go through, one through seven, and you put on a good performance at the pro day. And so the expectation that you might go in some later rounds and you don't get drafted. And so after the draft, what's going through your mind about football and the next step? Where are you at mentally with everything? That was hard. 
Yeah, that was a uh, that was like an uppercut, Chuck. That was a uh, I call it the most humbling time of my life. Uh, yeah, that definitely was humbling, Chuck. Uh, you, I had one through seven one. I'm just like, man, come on, ain't no way all these guys better than me. Somebody got me throwing salt on my name. Somebody. You know, I'm used to it, you know, and uh, I mean, something got to be wrong. What did I do this time? I know I got the talent. I clearly know I got the talent. You know, some guys that think they got it and some guys that got it. I'm not bragging, I'm not saying I'm dead. I'm not saying I am something I'm not. I just know what I put into this and I know what I should have got out of it. But sometimes things don't go your way. You know, sometimes, and sometimes God got bigger plans for you down the line and, uh, I was at my dad's house that day, man. Small living room, man. Very small. One room, one bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm just, I didn't want to be around nobody. Everybody kept saying, uh, do a party, do this. I'm not that type of guy. You know that Chuck. I didn't want to party in school, man. So, like I said, that one pass, and I'm on the couch, man. It's a little couch, and uh, one through seven, one pass. And I'm just like, all right, cool. I know. Right after that, we get calls. We get phone calls from the league. So I'm like, all right, I'll get a phone call. I didn't even get a free agent call, Chuck. Like 4,000 yards, man. Like 4,000, man. Like all purpose. Like no call. Like at all. Come on, man. It got to be some type of politics, you know? But it didn't go my way. So I did end up getting a call from. Pittsburgh Steelers, and uh, they invited me to a tryout. They had already signed the back, and he was looking for a bigger back. And it was a bigger back there with me. And I was there with all of them, man. If you go back to it, we all did our thing, man. But they already had one side, uh, one sign. I think his name was like Ross Schumer from out of like Lehigh, same small school as me. He had a great career as well. And uh, a guy out of Northern Illinois, uh, big back. It was good itself, so uh, they ended up taking them too. But I felt like my production throughout that week was very good, and uh, I feel like they seen it too. But you know, in the league, once you committed to something, you committed to something, and uh, that's where the politics come in at. And uh, they kept those two, and the guy that was doing all the recruitment stuff. As I was getting cut, he followed me out the door. He said, "You'll be back." I'm looking like, I'm going to be back. Yeah, right. If I'm going to be back, why you ain't keeping me, man? You know? That's how I know it's politics. And I'm just like, all right, man. You just got to take it, suck it up, go for what it is. You're not the only person in this world. You're not the only back in this world. There's plenty of backs better than you. And I'm like, I can take that. I can understand that. But when you get to see that and you real on yourself about things and you got to see what you've done and what they did and it didn't add up, you seem like, Whoa. What's happening? So once again, I got to be God. I could have got injured, could have got anything, and never got to get my opportunity to come back. So they cut me. And a few months go by. This is a true story. A few months go by. I'm back in Ohio still, or Akron, and uh, my daughter's back in Harrisburg. And I'm just like, I couldn't really face the Harrisburg yet. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I couldn't face it yet. So I'm, uh, I'm back in. Uh, Ohio, and I'm just chilling out, man. You know, I kept up on the internet. You know, I kept up on the updates and stuff. Stillers, Stillers mainly. But I got a, I got a call a day before I was laying up at my sister's house, and uh, I got a call a day before by the Arizona Cardinals, mm -hmm. and it was like, "Hey, what you doing? Still working out and all that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm working out. I'm staying, you know, healthy and all those type of things." And the next day, the Pittsburgh Steelers called me back. Wow, how ironic, man. Now I'm walking in. I could have been out in Arizona, maybe with a, just David Johnson to, you know, you know, it's just David Johnson out there. But now I'm going to Pittsburgh Steelers, where I'm no longer in a pro style, which they pretty much is a power back running. So now I got to change that once again. Arizona's it was a spread at the time, so I got to change. Like I said, I had to change that once again going to Pittsburgh. And when I get there, man. Time to go. They put me in first day. I'm behind Le'Veon and I'm behind Legendary. I know he's going to be a Hall of Famer. D'Angelo Williams, right. uh, Memphis, you know, North Carolina Panthers. And that's two backs already behind. You know you're not beating them out. It's politics. You're a free agent. You got to run a 100-yard run every time you get the ball if you're going to beat them out. Right. Practice. 
Mm-hmm. So now it's only one spot left, man. They gave it to a fullback, man. So you got to get that to a fullback. But I did my thing, man. I felt like I, I got four first-team reps in practice. Literally, four first-team reps in practice, and all four were touchdowns, man. One was a 90-yard touchdown. Uh, one was a one-yard touchdown. And the others was, like, just, like, little 20s, 20s and on end. But it was just like, man, Le'Veon had a great line, man. And that was a great organization. I wish I could have stayed. But, you know, God got bigger plans and better plans. Yes. From your experience uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers, you got a chance to play uh, for Coach Mike Tomlin. What was your experience like under his leadership? He's a soldier, man. I give it to him, man, for us being African-American men. He stood on everything an African American should be. I just say those things right there. He was a stand up guy, he was a truthful guy. He reminded me of Larry Johnson. I only knew Larry Johnson for 10 minutes. And 10 minutes was one of the realest college conversations I ever had, though. Right. And he reminded me of the same thing. And that's the reason why he still is in Pittsburgh, because he's a real stand up guy. And those are hard to come by in the business of snakes and politics and other things that you may have to go through, you know, to get to the top in that business. And I don't blame nobody for getting to feeding your family. However you got to feed your family, you got to feed your family. However you're going to do it, you're going to do it. But that guy stood on all his morals and that guy stood on all his principles. And I respect that. And I always respect that. I don't want nothing bad to say about him. And when you get cut, you know, it's give you a black bag. I seen plenty of grown men walk out black bag. Tied up on your back, your ears, shoulders, like you Santa Claus. You walk out the door and you crying, grown man, you know. But that's normal. That's your dream. You're still a grown man, but you're still a kid for real. You're still a 23 year old child that's just getting out of college, you know. He asked me uh, when they cut me. <laughs> when they cut me, I was laying in. A, I was in the hot tub, man. It was a guy. Uh, he's still in the NFL. I forgot his name. Long story short, we're gonna get straight to it. He said, uh, "Dang man, they out there cut people." He's a veteran. I don't know nothing about cutting. All I know is this is final days of cuts. I thought I, I thought I was at least practice squad, you know. I go, <laughs> I come into the building after the last game. I get into the, uh, I get into the hot to jump, man. That guy come out of there like, uh, come hop in the hot tub minute and say, yeah, they cutting people, man. He said they out there getting everybody. <laughs> Straight like that. He said they out there getting everybody. I said, oh man. So I eased up out the, you know, I eased up out the uh, hot tub. I get to walk in towards the locker. Here comes a big diesel guy, one of the one of the cutting uh, expert guys. He said, Chisel. I know what this is. I go upstairs, but some people they just say, hey, they said you cut, get your bag, and you know, go about your way. He said, hey, time to run talk to you. I said, all right, fine. So I go talk to Colbert first, uh, which is the GM. And uh he say, uh, Hey man, you're a better. He, he says you're 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 a great player, an even better guy. I'm like yeah 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 whatever you know. I ain't on it. You know I ain't on the team at this point. That's what I'm thinking. Like yeah yeah whatever. If you thought I was that, keep me on the team. You know, young and dumb attitude. But they didn't have to give me the time of the day. You know what I mean? Like I should be the one that was thankful for that. They gave me the time of the day to thank me and tell me how proud it was of me and what I'd done during that. So that was an accomplishment to me because I didn't do that to everybody. And then from there, I turned in my playbook, which we all have to do. We all do that, you know, you turn in that playbook first thing first. And uh, I went to turn the playbook. The guy that bought me in and told me I will be back after the first time I got cut. I talked to him as well going out. That was the guy I turned my playbook in. He's like, dang, man, you almost had it. And I was like, I'm bleeding because he told me I was going to come back too. He like, you almost had it, man. But the way this works. Yeah. Now I'll go talk to Tomlin. Tomlin say, uh, hey man, he's like, what you plan on doing from here? I just looked at him, man. I'm just like, you know, I'm just thinking in my head, like, man, you don't even know where I gotta go back to, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, I'm just like, and deep down inside, man, I just wanted to like just cry, bro. I'm like, man, you don't even know what I gotta go back to. That's what I'm thinking. So I come back home after that. Well, dang, the only thing he said, he told me, he said, uh, if you leave out of here today and we cut you and you don't play football for the next five years, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. That's what he told me. So I walked up out of that door, man. I uh, gave uh, the Canada League one try, one snap. I got over there. It wasn't for me. 
came back. I said, hey, man, I ain't really had him on no more love and passion for it no more after that, man. Because I gave him my all, Chuck. You know what I mean? I had, I got a kid at this time. I just met my wife, which was my girlfriend at the time. And, uh, I ain't had a time. Like, yeah, so in the, in the midst of... Yeah, for sure. No, I definitely agree with that. And and that's what changes for you once you become an adult, man, you get out of college and you get into the real world, you start thinking about uh, your family. Your decision making ain't just based around yourself. It's based around your family. And like you said, at that time, you had a daughter and you're in the midst of uh, dating uh, your girlfriend at the time, who is now your wife now. And so when, when your life changed from a family standpoint, you know, your mindset changed as far as like opportunities and, and what you're trying to do from a personal standpoint, it goes to hey, what's best for the family? And you have to find, you know, employment and kind of get right to it. But in the midst of you being with the Pittsburgh Steelers, actually during training camp, uh, you actually got a chance to, to go back uh, to your graduation. You actually graduated with your bachelor's degree in sport management from the University of Akron. You know, how did it feel to walk across the stage, being in the midst of training camp? That wasn't a highlight of my career at that time, but it is now. Yeah. Once I got done with football, that was a highlight, man, and why y'all pushed us so hard and told us to get the degree and why you was there at that time, why you was mentoring us and trying to juggle your hard job at the same time, but still giving your everything to us, man. That was dope. That was a highlight, Chuck. That was one of my better times, man. You know, because I go from Jacksonville from an NFL game. I'm, that probably was a highlight, Chuck. I ain't gonna lie, man. I feel like a boss a little bit, you know? Yeah. You know? I'm on a little preseason squad, but man, I feel like the boss, man, it was, we got to uh, fly back, and uh, my mom and them was there waiting on me. And shout out to all my family as well, my mom, dad, brothers, and sisters, they was waiting on me. They took me up to the graduation after the game. We drove up there from Akron uh, to Pittsburgh, and uh, yeah, man, you and Christina was there waiting for me, man, as well, you know what I mean? Like, Y'all was waiting there. That was big, man. That was a high, that's why I said it was a highlight. And that's why I'm able to still talk to you and vibe with you to this day, man. Because, like, when you're authentic, I don't think that ever runs out, man. And from an authentic person to another, I think that's that's all you can ask for, man. Is just be authentic with me, man, and just pray for me. That's all I ask from any man or woman, man. And that's what you did. And you mentored us and you gave us things that you ain't even had to waste your energy on and could have took to, back home to your own kids. So I forever thank you for that. And, uh, I told my wife this too, like, so this ain't no, you know, I, I thank y'all for coming to my graduation, man, because that meant more than anything. My own, my own coach is there to come to my graduation. Yeah. So that just lets you know, man, to treat those that treat you right and the ones that love you and ones that give you all might not be the person that's the highlight of your life at that moment, you know what I mean? Or the person that's running your life at the moment. And I say running your life at the moment because the coaches did run your life at the moment. They control right. their life. They control whether they get playing time or not. Like, they ain't come to the graduation. Like, these is the guys that come to your graduation. Christina is, is the ladies that come to your graduation. The people you see every day. Mm -hmm. You see coaches every day, too. But you see your mentors. You see the guys who work into the study halls with us and those that's in there, man, they really there for a reason. And when you see them reach out and give extra, cherish that, man. They say you always cherish a few things. Your, uh, your advisor in college, your train, your uh, trainer, the one that works on your body. And uh, yeah, it's your, it's your counselor, your trainer, and I want to say your position coach. I mean, no, not your position coach, the equipment manager. So your counselor, the trainer that works in your body, and the equipment manager, you never piss off. Because them is the main guys you got to see every day. Them is the guys just got to dress you and go on the field. They can leave your helmet in Oklahoma. They can leave your helmet in Akron. You got a game in Oklahoma, and now you can't play. And you're going to need them extra gloves, you know what I mean? Like extra wristbands. Gloves, every game, you need the gloves. You go to a trainer. Hey, you injured? They can keep you injured. Mm -hmm. You failing? You about to fail out? You gotta see a counselor. Yeah. They can, they can, they can get you up out of here. So, man, you dumb as the guys that you cherish, man, and the women that you cherish, and you try to keep, you know, uh, relationships with. And Chuck, I know you're not bragging. I know you don't say it much, but you got countable people jobs that since I've been at Akron, and 
even now, like you still reach out to us and the people that had close relationships with, uh, with you. You got a lot of people jobs and a lot of people opportunities to still keep up with people, man. Major respect to you. No, nah, I appreciate it, man. Sure. I think the biggest thing for me, man, it was just trying to pass down the information and the knowledge that I learned during my career um, and just really was appreciative for y'all letting me be a part of y'all life as well. You know what I mean? So I got a chance to be a part of that day that was legendary because, you know, you get off a plane coming from a professional football game and he drive right up to Akron. And it's like, before you know it, man, you're like walking across the stage, but nobody really in the audience knows outside of your family. And that's like, this guy's actually playing in the NFL right now. He got to go back to practice by that night. But the fact that the Steelers let you do that. And then I was just a part of it looking from the side of just seeing like, he's got to change modes that quickly. And I was just happy to be a part of the story. Well, uh, but you get an opportunity to transition into the world world and you transition back and you get an opportunity to work at Harrisburg high school um, as an educator and as a coach, you know, what was that experience like for you? That was dope, man. Shout out to Calvin Everett, uh, Hasbro High School uh, uh, head football coach. And also he is the uh, athletic director at the Hasbro High School. Shout out to him. Uh, he got me that job. And a uh, lady by the name of Natasha uh, Harris, uh, she's married now. I don't know if still her name. But they got, the, uh, they got me that job as a uh, teacher, a uh, special education teacher. And uh, <clears throat> that was great, man, because I was lost during that time. And uh, – Coach Calvin called me up to the field and he asked me, did I want to coach? And I'm just like, uh, I don't know. I'll come talk to you face-to-face. I want to talk to him face-to-face. Long story short, he told me to stay up on the field and uh, see if I wanted to coach and keep coming up here each day that I wanted to, not that he wanted me to, that I wanted to. So I just kept going each day and it made me feel like I got back into football. And that was a great highlight of my life too, man, because that got me to feeling a little bit of – sense of normal like you know back to normal in my life you know being around football I felt like I was in it and I got to go to you know and uh that was that, that was great man he got me into special education special education was great for me man because special education where I'm from is just problem kids problem child kids that they will call them and uh, that was great for me, man. I had never had no problems, you know. You can have a little normal problems, you know, kids, you know, kids with a disability, you know. Things happen, man. I respect it because you just want to be normal. You just want to be like anyone else. And uh, I feel like I helped a lot of young men that year and the next year after that, man, because I got to relate where they were coming from and where they were trying to maybe go, you know what I mean? And I didn't pretty much do all of it from being shot to, you know, on the other side of the fence to doing things uh, that young people do in the youth today. So luckily I got to go through that. And I feel like that was God getting me through all these hurdles to come back and do this. And I got to go back and just give them the raw and the realness and get to teach them as well and give them the power and the, knowledge and everything else, man. So that was good. I I, uh, I definitely didn't take advantage of it like I should, though, because I was a young 24-year-old young man. But looking back at it at 29 today, I can't wait to uh, get back into a teacher role. And uh, that was a great time, man. And the reason why I'm not teaching today is because we had school layoffs. And uh, I was in those layoff cuts because I didn't have enough seniority. I was two and a half years in, pretty much three years of seniority. I was in that, man. I got cut from that. So, yeah, man. So, like a thousand of us, man. So, I suffered from that. Never got to really get back in, man. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll be able to get back in soon, though, man. They changed up a lot of regulations and a lot of things is going on now, man, with COVID and other things. So, I'm, like I said, God is awesome, man. I ain't in those schools for a reason, man. Who knows? Like, you catch COVID, you know. God bless those who caught COVID as well. For sure. So, like, you currently uh, work. Um, at the Keystone Residential Program, working with autistic adults. You know, talk about your current role. Current role, man, working with uh, autistic adults from a uh, lower spectrum to a uh, higher spectrum. And uh, just basically, you know, just helping them live a daily life. That's awesome too, man. Just helping them live a daily life, uh, giving them a sense of normalcy in their life and uh, 
just letting them live and just helping them, you know, just you're pretty much like a crutch to them, you know, anything they need or if they fall in you there to, you know, put them right back on the place. And sometimes they need help making food. Like, you know, they, they go through their little problems. You're there to try to calm them down. And at the end of the day, man, they just want to be normal. Once again, everybody just want to be normal, man. They just want to be normal just like us. Their brains just not allowing them to, and they wasn't, you know, they got blessings in other ways that we don't. We got blessings in other ways that they don't. Put it like that. And, uh, the blessings that we got, we try to help them. And the blessings they got, they try to help us. It's a sense of tranquility in it too, man. Because you get, you get a. It's, it's a rewarding job because you're helping people that, you know, you're truly helping on a daily life basis. You know, sort of like the job you do is rewarding. You're helping young men. I'm helping autistic men. Uh, no, all that stuff's good, man. It's, it's good that you're in a position to give back and, and you're in a people business, you know what I mean? And so perfect for your personality, man, because you like to engage with people, man, and help others, man, and, and, and communicate. Uh, but we're going to transition into the last segment of the show, which is called the top five segment of the show. So I'm going to give you some categories and you give me your top five in those categories. So starting off with the first question. You played the running back position. Give me your top five running backs of all time. AP for ah man, can AP AP AP? If you let me AP one through five is AP, but I'm gonna go AP all time. All time. Or let me your top five. five. What's your top five? Adrian Peterson, Barry Sanders. Torrell Davis, LaDainian Thomas, Water Payton. And I'll put Water Payton bef before all of those. So I'll go, let me put them in an order order for you. I'll go Water, I'll go AP, Water Payton, Torrell Davis, yeah, AP, Water Payton, Torrell Davis, uh Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders. And uh and, and LT. I think you said LT, right? Thomason. Yeah. Thomas. Crazy man because a lot of running backs like AP was so special yeah. that I don't really put nobody in his league, man. And when you say top five, I really ain't got a top five, Chuck. It's really like a top three. You know, like the other people that I might have named may may not be in nobody else's top five because they probably not top five. But this is my top five in the 29 years that I've been living. Like, I can't really – I went back and actually got to watch Water Payton. Like, I didn't go back and get the – Emmett wasn't that great to me. You know what I mean? He had a great line. You know, I can't take nothing from Emmett, though. Like, Emmett was better than me, so I can't you know, take nothing from Emmett. But it was a certain AP, man. He, he, he's different. He's still playing. Come on. Still playing, no. I could have put, put Shady in there. Yeah. From, from, the, from the bird, I put him in there, but I'm leaving him out. Nah, and, and that's, the thing, that's the thing about it. it. It's your top five, you know. So like the guys you gave, man, they all Hall of Famers, and um, them guys was big time across the board. Guys that could could run the ball and catch the ball. So my next, yeah. you're a, you're a huge basketball fan. You played basketball growing up. Give me your top five NBA players of all time. A. A. I. LeBron. Either one can go one or two. A. I. LeBron. LeBron. A. I. A. I. LeBron. Uh. Shaq. For sure. Yeah. Kevin. Okay, so we got we got count these. A. I. LeBron. Shaq. K. D. Steph Curry. Ooh, that's pretty good right there. That's that's a good five right there. I like that one. Uh, in my time frame, I'm not going. I'm not a 29 year old man trying to talk about. I seen people from 45 play. I'm not doing that. That's something I don't do. I'm going to stand on my years and my years only. That's all I know. No doubt, man. So you're a guy that's traveled in your life, and give me the top five places you've ever visited or vacation. Oh, Jamaica's number one for sure. Jamaica has definitely been the best I've been to. Uh, Bahamas, 
was next. Uh, we just went on the cruise last year. The Bahamas was uh, that just Bahamas whole trip was dope. The Bahamian uh, trip was nice. Uh, Las Vegas, I love Las Vegas, man. I love Las Vegas. Me and my wife got a timeshare down there, mm -hmm. so we'll be going down there a lot more often. My son's two right now, so it's kind of hard. But uh, yeah, Las Vegas is three. Mm. Akron is definitely number four. I ain't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that because I, I know it's, I know it sounds dumb, man. But like even my wife, you know, like. Still to this day, man, like when I go to Akron, I get kind of a piece I never really got. It's, yeah. it's kind of weird, I know, but uh, well, it's a great like, place, man. It's a great here, place. Here, man, I get, I still get a sense of peace I never really got. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's telling. I, I'm not saying if we move there, like it'll be better on mental and all that. But I do know when I go there, present to this day, like I try to get back as much as I can. You know, as much as my wife allowed me. And like I literally like going by myself a lot, man. Cause I literally I feel a sense of peace that I don't feel, man. So that's number four. And uh, I've been a lot of places. Texas, I'll say Texas number five. And I just remember Texas more so because that's where the All-Star game was. It was nice. It was weather. We got to see the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. And uh, I'm a family man for us. Like, I'm a family man. I try to be as much of a family man as I can. And uh, my family was down there. And that was a proud moment for me because I was going through the draft process and all that. My I gave them an opportunity to come to Texas and get to see Texas, you know, like, they was there to see me, but they got to see they got to see way more than me, and it was way bigger than me, man. And I think that's what meant so much to me, you know. And that's what means a lot to me today, man. And that's all I really wanted to be in the league for, man. It wasn't to really get the fame because I feel like I already was who I was before that, and I always knew who I was, and I was never had that type of identity problem all the way, you know what I mean? I just wanted the money to support the family in a way that I didn't have to grow up, you know? And not saying money solves everything, but I wanted to give my little boy something that he never had before. And I'm still allowed to do that to the day. Right. But that would have made it a lot easier. Let's just be honest. You ain't tricking no by saying, oh, I got it. I'm doing better. Like, no. Uh, the money would have been better, but who knows if I would have took a hit to where I couldn't even carry my little boy or... Yeah be able to you know so money's not everything you know even though i wish i could have gave him a little better head start my family a little bit better head start but hey i'm here man I'll make it work for sure man and my last question of the top five segment you're a sneaker head uh i took some of the sneakers that you got man i was able to cop some because i see them on on your feet first uh so give me your top five sneakers of all time or your top five that you own or just your favorite five sneakers uh, of all time? I might have lost it on the sneaker tip. I'll never lose it, but right now I ain't got it. Um, <laughs> you know, the sneakers is always still, we always still lace. Like we ain't never, you know, they ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Air Max 97s, A1, gotta do that. Yeah. My, uh, this, that's, Gunshot that I'm suffering from. I mean, the gunshot I suffered from when I was young, I, it don't allow me to wear them as much, you know what I mean? Because it hurts my foot. You know, my foot's a little bit better than the other one. So it hurts, so I can't, you know, yeah. as much. But they're definitely my favorites. Uh, Air Jordan's the number fours. Mm -hmm. Jordan's number one. No, Jordan number one. Mm -hmm. Jordan number fours. Mm -hmm. So we got 97s, the ones, the fours. Uh, Balenciaga, uh, the Balenciaga runners was the most comfortable shoe I probably wore. And I'll definitely give it to the, it's about to be another designer, but hey, man, I, I, I think the, I, I think the, uh, what they call, uh, just have 
Alexander McQueen's. Okay. I had some like, high purple ones. They pretty. They was pretty dope, man. It was like a highlight type of color. A little flashy, but they dope. So we got the ninety sevens. We got the ones. We got the fours. We got the uh, Balenciaga runners, and we got the Alexander McQueen's. Ah. Nah, man, I appreciate you doing that, man. And, and just to go back a little bit more into that, man, one thing about uh, Jawan Chisholm, man, you always had style. I don't think I ever seen you wear nothing twice, you know, during your time of Akron. I, I maybe might have seen you wear one pair of shoes twice, but you always had fashion. You always had swag. You always had shoes. And I would see some shoes that you had on. I'm like, man, I might have to grab them, man. So you inspired a lot of people, man, just with the fashion, man, and, and the shoe game, man. You was on that real early and you had the new kicks from the new era, but you also knew about the older era from guys like in my era that, that wore the same kicks that you had on as a younger guy. But, man, we at the end of the show, man. First and foremost, I want to thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate you just taking the opportunity, uh, man, to sit down and talk about your story, to tell your story, man, from your lenses. And so many times, man, we get so caught up on all the, the A-list celebrity act, actresses and, and, and actors and, and people that are famous, which we got love for them. But there's a lot of people out there that are, are doing great things every day. They're inspiring a lot of people and helping people on a daily basis. And prior to what they're currently doing, they had a story that led them to where they are. And so uh, one of the reasons why I selected you is because, man, you have a journey, man. And along your journey, man, you overcame a lot of adversity. I mean, if we go all the way back to when you were in ninth grade and you were in a position where you got shot in the foot and you were thinking about maybe getting your whole foot amputated. And had that happened, you would have never been able to be exactly where you were. But you overcame that. And then you were a guy that came from Harrisburg and you went to the University of Akron and you set records there and you did a lot of great things and you got your degree and then you went into education and now you're helping people, autistic adults, and working a job, man, where you got to have a lot of patience, but at the same time, you're empowering people every day. And so that's what it's about, man. So along your journey, man, you've done a lot of great things. You overcame some adversity. And another part of this show is, man, giving their people their crown while they're alive, man. So we want to give you your crown today, man. We salute what you're doing, the work that you're providing for a lot of people out there, man, and your journey, man, because somebody's going to be able to learn from your journey. And a lot of people were inspired by the work that you did on the football field and off the field as well. Hey, Chuck, man, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me on your show. It's definitely an honor. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the life lessons. Thank you for still keeping in touch, man. And just much love, man. Thank you for being authentic and thank you for reaching out. And thank you for just the, you know, just the uh, remarks you give back, man, and all the positive energy you give me, man. Forever love on this end, man. For sure, man. Now, I appreciate you, man. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning into your journey. Be safe and God bless. Yes.